Welcome to Don't Fear the Patent Clause. Uh, my name's Deb Nicholson, and uh, you can, this is my Twitter. If you want to follow me on Mastodon, you can. I've been having trouble finding friends over there, so uh, that would be cool. I'm not a lawyer, um, and uh, I think we don't have lawyers in the room. Is that still the case? Not that you're not welcome. You're completely welcome, um, and that's fine. Anyway, so uh, I'm also not like a massive Blue Oyster Cole fan. I just had that one song stuck in my head, and um, it kind of like I was thinking about uh, like the different things that happened when um, the Free Software Foundation updated GPL version two to GPL version three, and there was a patent clause, and people would go on Slashdot to get legal advice, which is a terrible idea, by the way, and be like. I heard the new version of the license means you have to give all your patents to RMS. And I'm like, why would that be the case? Or whatever. Like, that's just ridiculous. So, um, so it seemed like uh, I thought maybe like people would eventually like find better sources for legal advice and come to understand and love the patent clauses. Um, but that didn't quite happen. So hence this talk. We're going to go through them and uh, look at where they came from and what the intent is and how they actually work. It does not mean you have to give everything you own to RMS. That's the spoiler alert. Um, so, like I said, I'm not like the massivist Blue Oyster Cult fan, um, but I, I'm also aware that maybe like uh, in the free software community, like talking about software patents is maybe itself a little bit of a B-side. Because um, we like to talk about licenses and don't get me wrong, everyone loves to crank up the patent troll argument every so often, or, you know, like, because they make everyone mad and everyone's like, oh, patent trolls, they're so easy to hate. Um, but then, like, going in and writing, like, sophisticated legal language about software patents so that we can get on with our lives and build free software is a little less fun, maybe. But still important, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, so why... Why is it such a mess? Just for, you know, for fun. Um, so software, uh, software is covered by both copyrights and patents. Um, neither of them is actually like a particularly good fit. And that's because software isn't very much like other things. Um, it's not a story, um, even if your comments are very verbose. Um, it is not really a map. It's not an artwork. It's not a play. It's not a novel. Um, but you write it. So someone thought copyright makes sense for patent, uh, for software. Um, and for a while, that was enough. We thought, like, yeah, OK, like, let's just have, like, if you just copy my software, then you either interact with whatever terms I've set, or you get default copyright there. So all of our free software licenses are built on copyright first and foremost. <coughs> Because in order to get into interacting with the system that put them under default copyright, we had to invoke that copyright and then change it. So all the free software licenses we have are built on that. Um, which was okay for a while because that was the place where people were saying like, oh, you took my software. Like, no, I didn't. I changed your software or whatever. Um, and then about 15, 20 years ago, people started patenting software which, as we said, is not really like other things. It's written, but it's more like a set of instructions. Um, I mean, sometimes you're trying to compile and it doesn't do anything, but it's supposed to do something. And so it's supposed to have a function. Uh, and so functional claiming is a particular term in the patent office, which means I've described the function. I am claiming that my invention has this function. And so if you were to do it for, say, like a fork, you would say, I have created this device that spears food and carries it to the mouth. And then you would draw a picture of a fork. And the patent office would be like, yes, I understand the function of this device. And now I have seen a picture of it. I understand how you intend to accomplish this function. Now, for software, if you've ever tried to draw a picture of what your software is doing, not as much. So what was happening was people would get, uh, in the patent office, they would get a, a software patent application that was like, I thought of this problem, and I planned, I planned, I'm going to fix it with software. And then it's like, well, where's the picture? And it's like, oh, here I drew a box, which is the monitor, and then like a person typing, and then like some letters and arrows. And they're like, okay. 
Sure, uh, I don't really get software because the US Patent Office had not ever seen that stuff before, so they were like, and you guys don't really pay me enough to spend more than a couple hours on each application, so here's your patent. So we had this situation, which was not good. Lots and lots of patents, poorly written, weird diagrams, claiming to do things that had not been done. You can't, if you have a patent on something that you actually can't do, like, should you be able to keep other people from writing code that fulfills that function? I don't think so, but that was the world that we ended up with. It turns out suing is also not super compatible with collaboration. So say you're a bunch of friends and you hang out and you're like, cool, writing this thing, and then like large company with huge patent portfolios like, hi, can I participate? And you're like, I don't want to be sued for patent infringement, I'm out. So this was not good. Um, it created a real chilling effect on innovation with uh, patent holders, with entities that didn't know each other very well, all these sorts of things, because what if they're just coming and pretending to be our friend, collecting information on what we're doing, and then they're going to sue us all? And there are enough times where it seemed like maybe that was what had happened. So, uh, so that was, that's also not good. Uh, could we fix that with legislation? Maybe. Um, so we did, just a few years ago, do a major overhaul of patent law in the U.S., the America Invents Act. We harmonized with the rest of the world. We went from first to invent to first to file. I'm not sure what we get out of that deal, but it makes everything match, which people like. Um, we did a couple of other things. Uh, added inter partes review process, which means like, hey, can you take this patent back and make sure that it still makes sense? Um, but the things that are not on the table are the bad actors, practicing entities, real companies that hold patents that are suing other people for doing a thing that they thought maybe one day they'd get around to. There's not a lot of political will to fix that, mainly because those companies have been lobbying. They, have, they paid a lot of money to get all those patents, uh, and they want to maintain them, and they're an income source. Once It's kind of like the, the first taste is really exciting, and then people start looking at your budget, and they're like, what's that magic budget line where we got money for sending three letters? Let's do more of that. <laughs> it's, it's very it's addictive, I think. Um, and so, uh, so those companies lobby on behalf of uh, changing the patent system materially enough to make that situation not happen. Now trolls, trolls people will talk about, there is still a lot of different kinds of reform uh, being discussed with regard to the troll problem. Nobody likes trolls, and especially the US. Like, people getting money for nothing makes us mad. Um, so, uh, so the troll problem, there are some different things. Oh, it turns out, like actually, um, I just recently read this thing, New Hampshire had a case where a, a patent troll was suing a practicing entity, a small one, and the, the practicing, the company they were suing kept referring to them as a patent troll in all their documentation. <laughs> and the, the troll said, like, ask the judge, can you make them stop calling us a patent troll? And the New Hampshire judge was like, nope, <laughs> sorry, that's not a thing I'm going to enforce in my courtroom. <laughs> So that was pretty hilarious. So people don't like trolls. There may still yet be more reform, legislative reform, to fix the troll problem. But not the practicing entities being bullies problem. So, so then that means we have to put patent clauses in our copyright licenses, which is messy. <laughs> um, so we wrote, we wrote new licenses to deal with this problem. Uh, and, and they span a pretty wide spectrum. So we're going to go through them. The patent clauses from Hopeful to Hardball. Uh, the first one, which is the, the wispiest and most hopeful of all, is the patent pledge. This is, a, this is usually a pledge that is a couple of sentences and a press release that is several pages long. Uh, they aren't binding. They tend to have a lot of language about, like, don't be jerks and we won't be jerks, which is... Subjective, not objective. You can't go to a court and say, like, we're pretty sure we believe this company's been a jerk. Um, so they're not binding, and they're usually for, um, for the press uh, to be like, hey, we, we know everyone's talking about that patent thing. Uh, our marketing office thought we could do this thing where we said we won't be jerks for their patents. Um, so those are useless, is what I'm saying. 
implied patent grants. So, if you remember, we said there were a lot of software licenses that were written before we had this glut of patenting all the things. Um, but does that mean that older licenses don't give you a patent grant? Uh, as we said also, too, software by nature is functional. And so if you look at, like, the MIT license, I'm going to read that, it says, you can deal in the software without restriction, which sounds like you can use it. You can implement the function of the software, which is usually what patent covers, right? So even the MIT license, which is very short and doesn't have the word patent in it at all, some people believe has an implied patent grant that if you were to use that software as it was provided to you and you used, of course, the patents that are part of that software, that the person offering that license to you could not come back and sue you for the patents that cover that software. Who knows? It hasn't been tried in court. The people who think the implied patent grant is not a thing tend to be companies that I expect to actually write the letters where they bring those patent suits. So it's a little biased, right? Um, but let's take a look at the older permissive licenses. So um, OPS, like calc put in to impress doesn't look very pretty. Um, but so uh, MIT license and implied patent grant, BSD license and implied patent grant. Um, there are a category of things where someone's like, here's a permissive license, and then here's an addendum that talks about patents explicitly. So the BSD plus patent grant, this was something that Intel was using for a while with a software called InfiniBand um, back in like the SourceForge days. Uh, and so it said, you know, you get, you get a patent. Um, whether Intel was doing that because they wanted to give you an alternative to taking the software under GPLv2, or if they were afraid that people weren't going to take the software under GPLv2 and use it in their stuff, not sure that that nuance has been lost to the sands of time. Uh, the Facebook thing, which then they rolled back on, it turns off it's like a kind of a bad idea to be secretive and, and nasty with your legal uh, licenses when everyone can talk about you on this massive thing that you built. Um, so they rolled it back, but it had an explicit patent grant. Uh, contributors give their patents to Facebook, and you lose your rights for any of the software that say, Facebook has provided if you sue Facebook or its affiliates for anything, which is like, it's kind of like a, so sometimes we talk about this part as a retaliatory clause, and the, the Facebook one isn't a sort of an extreme example. There are a couple of other companies that have similar things like this. Um, Palantir is one. I mean, they spy on us anyway. That's sort of their job. They're a government um, contractor that builds surveillance software. So um, not really expecting like a lot of kumbaya from them, but you know. Uh, so, you, so you can add a patent grant to a permissive license if you don't think the implied patent grant is strong enough or specific enough for your purposes. Um, but you, you don't... <laughs> Especially if you run a large social network where people will talk about your activities all day long, you should probably not do this. Um, or you shouldn't do that anyway. But uh, GPLv2 also doesn't mention patents because it was written in like 1991. So, um, but uh, there is a lot of conversation about whether or not GPLv2 has an implied patent grant. Um, and of course, Freedom Zero from the license says you have the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. So running the program means using, implementing the function, and that would mean invoking any of the patents that are associated with it. A lot of the GPLv2 stuff that comes from the FSF doesn't have patents on it because they don't believe in it, but there are other people that use that license and have patent different things. So if your stuff is under GPLv2, are you granting a patent? Yeah, maybe. Um, we're not sure. But, um, but it doesn't mention them, but there's a legal case to be made that there's an implied patent grant there. So let's go on to some of the more like modern permissive licenses. So um, most of the modern licenses, and by this I mean like Apache 2.0, uh, the Common Public License, the Eclipse, Eclipse Public License, and the Mozilla Public License have an express patent grant. Um, most of them also have contributor reciprocation. So if you put, if you add a little piece of the software and put it under the Apache license, it's expected that you also uh, grant 
a patent grant on the piece of the software that you wrote. Um, and it has some termination language, and that's where they get a little bit different. So here is the modern permissive. So the Mozilla public license, the Apache license, and the Eclipse public license all give you an express patent grant. Uh, contributors grant patents on, on their code, on their code, and then in the Eclipse public licenses case, on the whole work. So if you're doing a contributed, you know, a contributory like combined work, like say part A and part B, and you worked on part A, but you hold patents on either part B or some function that is completed by the combination of part A plus part B, then you offer that patent is what the um, <coughs> public license says. So what happens if you initiate a patent suit against the folks that gave you this free software? Which you shouldn't do because it's mean. But if you do do it, there is language to take care of that uh, in case like your you know, um, moral sense is not enough. There is legal language to make sure that you do the right thing. Um, so for the Mozilla public license, you lose your patent rights and your copyrights. So remember when we talked about how all free software licenses are based on copyright, but then these ones mention patents. So the termination clause, some of these licenses only make it so that you lose your patent rights. Um, but the Mozilla public license expressly says you lose all rights that you got under this license, which includes the copyrights and the patent rights. So that means you can't use the code for anything, even not just the thing that you are using that is covered by the patent. So, so there, there's a little bit of difference between these, these few licenses here, right? Um, and, and different intents, like, you know, you can see, like, the folks in Mozilla were like, hmm, they get nothing if they sue us. Apache was a little more like, oh, you know, maybe you can come back in, but for the time being, you lose the patent rights. And a lot of the um, termination clauses have some language about, like, what you can do to come back into our good graces and be allowed to use the software again. Um, basically, they stop bringing the lawsuit, but um, some other stuff, too. So um, let's take a look at the next category. So copyleft licenses, and um, I'm guessing if you came to a whole session on patent clauses, you probably understand copyleft, but the, the short version is, is that it, it's like the, the share alike. I've provided the software to you. If you add stuff to it and then redistribute it out into the world, please also put it under a license that makes it so that you're sharing as well. So that... I and the rest of the community can also share in your changes and continue the sharing kind of recursive system all the way through. So that's how copyleft works. Um, very short version. I'm assuming most of you have a, a little sense of this. But um, the copyleft licenses, except for V2, uh, all have an express patent grant. And uh, so they all say, like, yes, you absolutely get a patent, you know, you, also, you absolutely get the rights, patent rights, to use any of this software. Any patents that are associated with this code, you don't have to worry about if you use the code. If you contribute, it's another one of the A plus B. So if you hold a patent on A or a patent on B or some function that is completed by the code when A and B are added together, you offer that patent to the rest of the community. So it's a broad contributor reciprocation. And of course, there's a lot of termination language. It does not say RMS gets all your stuff. Um, although, you know, the FSF could certainly use your money. If you want to give him stuff, you should, but you're not required to by the license. Um, so, V2, before patents. Is it a patent grant? Yeah, maybe. So the thing that's interesting here is the copyrights are reciprocal in GPLv2, so if you think the patents are implied as well, then it's possible that a contributor patent grant is also implied. None of this has been tried in court. Nobody actually knows what would really happen. I suspect, uh, yeah, this would, it would be very interesting. Um, there, would be, there would be a lot of writing about that if someone decided to uh, bring a case that tested the implied contributor reciprocal grant in GPLv2. So I don't expect to see that, but if you do, like, it'll, you know, it'll be all over Slashdot and everywhere else. So do you lose your patent grant? Again, it's implied, probably, but maybe not. The language in GPLv2 only says that you, it only has language about what happens if you don't comply with the license and losing your copyrights. 
So V2, very all of the language that's explicit is about the copyrights and losing your copyrights. So GPL V2 and, and Afero Public License. Are people familiar with the Afero Public License? It's the it's GPL V3 for the web. So if you put if you put code up on a website then and it's under the Afero Public License, anyone who interacts with that code on the website also gets a link to the source code. Um, which is why um, a lot of companies that are using lots of open source somehow have very thin repositories available to the public because all that stuff is on their own servers in their buildings, so not being distributed. It's just that everybody is interacting with it all day long. So the Afero Public License was like, it would be disingenuous for us to update V2 and be like, all of a sudden, everything on the website has to be you know, reciprocal copyleft. So they wrote a separate license and said, if you, if you want to do that, that's what we think would be great and th the future and sharing more code. Um, but we made it, you know, we're making it a separate license. So that's what the Afero license is. So again, contributors get the, the offer grant on their stuff. On their stuff, uh, if in combination with the other stuff that's already in that code base uh, is a thing that they hold a patent on. And anything in the code base that they hold a patent on when they start contributing. If you initiate a patent suit, you lose your patent rights and your copyrights. Both the GPL and the Afero license are explicit about that. Um, and in fact, the clause is, is nearly the same. Uh, they were written around the same time, so why why rewrite? Do people have questions about that part? Okay. I'll do questions at the end, too. I know it's a lot of stuff. Um, so what about hardware? Just for fun, I thought, huh, hardware. I have a friend who, works, uh, who worked at Open Compute for a while when they were writing some of their open hardware licenses. Um, it's weird, because not all of them are based on copyright. So, um, so a lot of them, you lose... Uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's more about the patents and the function. So all of the uh, hardware licenses that are in use that I could find in, you know, in regular use um, give you an express patent, patent grant. Contributors, except for this one, uh, definitely grant license to use their patents. And then if you sue them, the open queue copyleft one you use, you lose your patent rights and copyrights. Same with their permissive. The taper one says just patent rights because there's no copyrights in there. there uh, so the two open compute licenses are like software plus hardware together. It, that's the intention uh, for the use of those two licenses. And then these two um, are just about the hardware. They don't mention the code at all. So you lose the, the patent rights with the taper license. And then there's no termination clause for the CERN license. And the license specifically says, this only covers the hardware and not the software. So you, you, even, um, even if there was some copyright uh, or some software involved in there, this license says that's, we're, we're not, that's not part of this situation. So, um, so I, I just thought it was interesting how, the, how another uh, community or an adjacent community decided to handle that. So the big picture, and possibly the ugliest slide I've ever made, is this. So there it is all in one big thing, in case you were wondering. And I'll put these up online, even though, as I said, it's the ugliest slide I've ever made. Um, but uh, so you can see how they kind of compare. Um, the, the, the main thing that you get with the patent clause is, uh, is that you lose your patent rights. So that's like the main thing. Uh, I think the problem was like people wanted to be able to say, like, hey, if you come hang out and pretend to be our friend and then turn around and sue us, like, you don't get nothing from us anymore, but you can't write that in legal language. So instead it says, if you sue us, then you lose your patent right. So that's like as close as you can come to saying, like, don't pretend to be our friend and then sue us. So, um, so what does that all mean? What does that all mean? Um, that's interesting. Uh, so as I said, most of this has not been tried in court. Almost, actually, almost none of it. Um, the only, there was a recent case with uh, VMware on one part of GPL v2, uh, and it wasn't about the patents at all. It was about the failure to provide source. So that's the only place where we've seen any of these licenses go to court. Uh, there, was, uh, there was one other where I think someone had forgotten to, or forgotten, who knows, um, 
to put, uh, you're supposed to say like where you got the software from. Some of the licenses say that. And there was one case maybe in South America it was like, hey, you forgot to say where you got the software from. And, and they're like, we forgot or we're trying to pretend it was ours. Uh, oh, all right, we're going to court. Fine, we'll do it. Um, so most of, our, most of our free software licenses have not been tried in court. But what's interesting about the courts is that um, they try really hard to avoid the uh, impression that they're making stuff up. So, uh, so a lot of our Western law rests on legal precedents. So you might be like, hmm, well, what does that mean? And it's like, well, I, I looked for the last couple of years, I couldn't find anything, and I had to keep going back, keep going back. 1585, somebody ripped a book in half and tried to take copyrights on two different halves, so we'll use that as our legal grounding for this case. That's how the courts work. The other thing that they like to take into account is the intention. So if your intention is well documented, which it is in the case of the Apache license and definitely in the case of the Free Software Foundation's licenses, then they will take that into account. Especially if it's been out for a long time, it's very widely known. The courts don't like when you say, oh, I found this thing and pretended to take it out of its context <laughs> and read it in a way that's super convenient and kind of lucrative for me. And the courts are like, yeah, we see you. <laughs> we see exactly what you just did there. So they don't like, they don't, they really don't like when people pretend that the context is, that there's no context and that, the, or that the context doesn't matter or that Somehow, like, an FAQ from the place they got the license was a thing they didn't bother to read and didn't feel like applied to them. Uh, are you kind of referring to the Yo-Yo Dine example and the GPL? Oh, uh... Does that enhance the GPL in the court size? I mean, we have no proof of this, but I always figured that that was mm -hmm. for what you're describing. Mm -hmm. Right, so, um, well, and that's why, actually, so the GPL has, that's why it has so much stuff in the license itself about what the intent is. Um, which some people find annoying because it makes the license really long and super verbose and has like funny stuff like the yo yo dine and whatever. Um, but it makes it, it means if, if someone were to go to court and say like, yeah, we didn't really think that's what the GPL meant. And it's like, it's in the license. Like the intent is in there. And it's, it's, it's not, <laughs> it's, kind of, it's considered a little bit poor form to put too much manifesto in your legal documents. And yet, it makes it very clear what your intention is if it's part of the license. So, um, so it would be very. It would. I think it would be hard for the courts to ignore stuff that's in the text of the license. The Apache license and the Mozilla license are a little bit more. Here's the terms, and then there's a an FAQ over here that you should also probably read. But it doesn't have quite so much of the manifesto and the like liberate the coders and users uh, stuff like included in the actual text of the license. Um, but I, I do think it's, you know, uh, even if the courts were to look at something with Apache and, so, and someone were to say like, oh, I didn't think that meant what it says it means, and be like, the Apache Software Foundation also has an FAQ. So if you were to apply that license to your code or bring code in under a license that like you're like, oh, I never heard of it until just today, and then I decided to put it on our whole product line and base our entire business model on it. And it's like, huh. And you never once typed apachesoftware.org into your browser to go see what was going on over there. Never once. The courts, I think, would be very suspicious of that. So that's in our, uh, that's in our favor. Uh, the other thing is that, like, hey, you know what? If it doesn't go to court at all, like, your reputation is on the line. Coming into the free software community and using the code and then pretending you didn't understand, you know, like, it's uh, like if you went to somebody's birthday party and ate their cake before the candles were there and they were blown out and the birthday person got cake, you could not pretend that you didn't know. This is not okay. And um, I, I don't think that businesses like that are going to be successful in the long run. Um, <clears throat> I go to a lot of uh, conferences, tech conferences, and um, the companies that are bad actors in the free software community, everyone knows. And they all know, especially when they're like, who do you want to work for nice? And it's like, oh, no, 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 not those guys. <laughs> so um, 
And it makes people not want to partner with you. And it's like, oh, hey, we're going to spin up this new foundation to work on a particular type of software. Like, well, we should invite, like, the people that always comply with the licenses, the folks that were nice to have at the table last time, uh, those people that always bring cake to the meetings, and the people who pretend they don't understand our licenses. Oh, no, 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 let's not invite them. So the, your false reputation is important, even if this stuff never goes to court. So... Um, and, of course, there have been other efforts to ameliorate patent problems. So the, the patent clause is part of, like, a constellation of solutions, uh, that none of which are complete, to try and work on this, like, why is math being patented when it's in the context of software, which we all agreed we weren't going to do, but now if you put enough verbiage on it and sprinkle computing words, you can apparently now do. So... Which, as we as we were before, is not real great for developers or users because it increases the cost because of all the suits. So, um, I work at the Open Invention Network. We have a defensive patent pool, so you can take a license, and all of the other free software and open source companies in that pool agree not to sue you on the body of work that we generally collaborate on, which is like the Linux kernel and GNU stuff, Android, and a bunch of programming tools like Python libraries and Ruby stuff and uh, web framework things. So if you're working on free and open source software in that space, you can sign here and all the other companies that are like, yeah, we got sick of moving headcount from engineering to legal and decided we'd just not sue each other every year anymore. So this is for you. Uh, and it's free to join. Uh, the license on transfer network, uh, that one's a little bit more focused on the troll problem. So this is an additional amendment to, uh, so if you have a patent and you sell it, you can put it in this pool of stuff, like this transfer network, and it goes with like a little rider. Uh, and so, so the rider says, if this patent ends up in the hands of a company that gets 50% or more of its revenue from patent suits, then you can't sue anyone that's part of this network. And this one isn't even just like a free software solution. There's like a bunch of car manufacturers in there and a bunch of like, um, like uh, shopping businesses and things like that, like people that just kind of use software that are like, yeah. Like people hate trolls. You can get a lot more done when you're like, it screws up patent trolls. And people are like, yeah, what is it? I don't know. I don't care. I'll do it. So, um, but it does have that limited usefulness. So that's another thing that people are looking at to try and figure out, like, how do we ameliorate the impact of software patents on our work? So, um, and then, so, <laughs> when I first started talking about pa software patents, like, people would be like, I get, like, these crazy questions, like, we should, we should patent, patent trolling. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's not a thing. We can't do that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> The other one like, I would get all the time, like, because I, I used to do a talk where I specifically talked about intellectual ventures, which is a, like a really big, massive patent troll with a particularly smug uh, executive. And, uh, and they're like, we should just go to Nathan Merville's house with bombs and stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 no. One, we're recording this. Um, two, also not a good idea. I bet he lives somewhere fancier than you do with some people at a gate that would keep you from doing that. So that would just be a waste of your time, especially once you were doing time. And also, like, not a useful, like, uh, you know, I, we should not go bomb people. That's, the, that's not how we're going to fix the software patent problem. <laughs> um, but it did seem a little tricky to be like, what about, you know, we talked about the political will. And, and I think, and, I, and it's hard. I, well, and especially right now to be like, do you think we could get something useful done? <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe we should start <laughs> tweeting about patent abolition <laughs> uh, and see if we can get something done there. But, you know, I think maybe in the future it, it might, we, we, could, we could get there. Uh, but it's going to be money. Uh, so remember I talked about the people who lobby against patent reform, uh, like the American Association of Trial Lawyers and like um, other companies that have like a huge patent portfolio already. Uh, if we're going to mount a campaign to abolish software patents, we're going to need money. Maybe you're excited to raise that money. That would be great. Uh, I'll give you some pointers. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, so that could be good. Uh, so I'm, I'm saying I'm not ruling out patent, software patent abolition, but it's, it's going to take a long time. Um, so, so where, is that, where does that put us? That puts us... 
so maybe so maybe the patent clause is like the the blue oyster cult of uh, of classic rock it's possible like maybe Sabbath is like the copyleft license or something like that I don't know um, but they all work together in concert pun intended sorry um, but uh, in order to continue working on the software patent issue, like we're going to have to look at all different solutions and have them work together. So um, I'm going to give you some more resources if you want to read more about this. Um, so of course, license-specific help. Uh, these are some. Of, these are some of the ones that I thought had really good thorough um, language about the intention and how to use that had a good, clear, explicit patent grant with like a reciprocal grant and uh, clear termination language. Uh, and then if you want to, like, so these are some organizations that work on ameliorating the effect of software patents uh, on our ability to use and write code. Um, probably you know, FSF and EFF are downstairs or over there. Um, and then patent progress and public knowledge work on, uh, like, the patent issue from, like, a legal standpoint, looking at different cases in Shepard. Uh, like following them through the courts to see how that affects the scope of patentability. And then, um, if you want to read about the patent, the implied patent grant in the MIT license, Scott Peterson steps through it is very, very thorough. Um, this one is about if you, if you want to go back and see, like, oh, I felt like there was like 70 billion different articles of the Facebook BSD3 plus patent grant. If you want to only read one, then just read this one. Uh, and then uh, if you're like, huh, the Apache 2 patent grant, like how does that work? Um, not FAQ style, but more conversational style. This article is really good too. So I always say I have patent, I mean, uh, picture credits. Uh, and I would be happy to take your questions on this topic. Thank you. Yeah, I know. It's, it's like bad news. I'm like, patents are out to get us. You don't have to cheer for that. <laughs> Do you guys, uh, yeah, in the back with the red. So I found, um, this is a little orthogonal to your talk, but the CERN patent license in particular seems really strange to me. Why would you have an explicit license with no termination clause? Like, why, why are they patenting these things, and then who are they licensing them to in, in this way? So it's the, it's, the, it's the folks that do the um, accelerator thing. Mm -hmm. um, my best guess is that they're academics and they couldn't imagine anyone being mean. I, I, I really don't know. I don't know that much about that, where that one comes from, but I, I think also, too, in the academic profession, like, your reputation really matters. So if, like, they offered it there and then it'd be like, oh, no one's coming to read your papers, like, because you, now we know you're, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Or they may have just, like, had... Uh, like a license excited intern that was like, we should put this stuff under a license. And then they left and never, like, and they, so without a clear goal and mission for the license, I don't know. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, maybe I'll look that up and see if I can find a better answer for you. But I wasn't able to find very much or, like, why they wrote it. Chuck. Do you think that, do you think that there are so many licenses because, Mm. We haven't solved the problem of licensing, or are you in the back, your moral sense in the back is screaming, saying, I, you can't pick favorites, but... They're not I, children. I can totally pick okay, favorites. So, so if, I was, if, I was writing a, if I was writing an app or whatever, mm -hmm. which license... Oh, God, <laughs> oh, you want to know which license to use? Oh, I can't believe oh this it's fun. I'm no, sorry. no, no. I'm I really live sorry. near MIT, and I go and I talk to students, and they're like, I just learned that there are things called software licenses. Which one should I use? And yeah, but that's not where I'm coming from. No, I know. Yeah. Um, but the answer is still, like, very lawyerly, it depends. Yeah, I know it's depends. Yeah. Well, and so there's, like, uh, the triage I would go is, like, are you writing code for your boss? Like, you should check and see what she or he wants you to use for a license because otherwise you might not have that job for very long. Um, if you were submitting a patch to something upstream that's already like 90% or more under some particular license, you should also be submitting under that license and not being the like, hey, what's up, Apache? Like, I'm going to put this Cassandra patch in under the Afero license. That just makes you a jerk. Don't do that. Um, 
And then otherwise, I would say take a look at in concert, like what do you what do you want to do, and what are you trying to accomplish with your code. If you uh, so when we were working on Media Goblin, we wanted people to take that code, um, change it, work with it, and submit the changes back out into the world. So we put it in the Afero license. It wasn't we weren't like we're gonna get rich and buy boats. It was more like hey, it would be really cool if there was like a a good stockpile of web based. Uh, code for sharing media online and if other people want to add to that we would love it so we picked the affair license so again it depends on what it your depends. goal is yeah okay, cool. but maybe that gives you a little bit like it, what it depends on yeah I figured you being so long you're probably the most steep person that I know and you being in this so long you have been in there so long you'd be like I just had this pet wish that I could spend a month writing my own perfect license. Oh I've no! Seen so many details. No. Okay, so you don't. No, want to no, do no, no, no. I do not want to write my own okay. license, and I don't recommend any of you do either. <laughs> Let me be clear. Use one of the licenses that is already happening that has staff people that maintain the FAQ page. Do not write your own license unless you have a really, you none of you have a really good reason. Don't write your own license. <laughs> um, yeah. No, and and the, there's there's different ones so. I think we have like a healthy amount of licenses with some differences. So like, you know, when we're looking at the permissive licenses with the patent clauses, like maybe your your boss or your workplace or the project you're working on is like, we just can't with the copy left. And it's like, okay, you know, well, how about the, you know, we've got some permissive licenses. So you could recommend the MPL. Like it has like you use you it has a great termination clause, it has a good broad contributor thing, you know, so like you could recommend one of those instead. So like if it's like, oh okay, we're, we're all for free software except for this one we couldn't get with this, or we couldn't, you know, or we hate Apache, we're never using their license, or whatever. It's weird stuff, you know. Um so you have options. So other questions? Yeah, in the front row. Uh so I've got I got kind of a two part question. So I've always heard that the Afero GPL is only for like network software. Is there any downside to using it on non-network software, like compared to the GPL? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> you can always like use whatever software you want in your house, like that doesn't touch the outside world. But if it if you're putting it up on a website, then you're invoking the distribution class in the Afero GPL. Okay, and uh, how important, especially when it comes to, like patents or whatever, are like license headers and source files? Oh, you should do them. Okay. You should always, always, always do them. Uh, as my friend, uh, like, so, um, I actually, I have one, I have a friend who works at Red Hat, and I've never seen him get so mad as when we were having lunch with this guy who was like, you don't have to put license headers on all of your files. And he's like, but it's just like copy and paste. You could, I mean, you wrote all this software. You could write a little script to just add it. Why would you not? And he's like, because you don't have to. And it's like, it's like thousands of lines of code. What's wrong with three lines at the top of each file? And he's like, yeah, but people can figure it out. And he's like, no. I get requests to put stuff into like Red Hat and Fedora all the time, and it doesn't have a license header. And I have to say no. We can't put it in anything. So yeah, do your license headers. There, there might even be, there's probably even a tool for adding them, like the script that he uses to add them, like I'm sure other people have come up. So you probably don't even have to write that script. You can just go get one from like, like a Git repo or something. Jason. I wanted to throw in, just a following up on this topic, that I don't know how useful it is to draw a distinction between terms run locally or a, a, something that's really good for the AG field, like a network program. Mm -hmm. Because there's companies, one example is called Rollout. Mm -hmm. And they say they can take any program for Google Linux and make it run in your browser. You can go to the website mm -hmm. and start to get mm -hmm. So I think it's great to use the AG field mm -hmm. for everything. Yeah, because then once it's out there, it could be, yeah. No, I, I don't anyone ever imagine running games in their browser. You know? No, that's great. I didn't know about that. I'm really excited. I, I use that to resize the pictures for the slides all the time. So, um, Of course, I don't know if like, the hotel Wi-Fi has been pretty garbage here, so I don't know if having to depend on the browser would have been right. good. But okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the back. So um, outside of the the free software context, I imagine there's quite a lot known about how legally um, patent retaliation clauses work. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe... Oh, like how, how does that? it compare for proprietary software? Well, and just, um, I don't know, is it, 
what's the what are the rules for that like? I mean, can I really put whatever patent retaliation clause I want in a license? Yeah, really Facebook it? rolled up a super weird one, and the Palantir one is apparently crazy paranoid. But um, uh, yes, you can. I mean, that's the thing. So like, when I when you're like, oh, is this enough licenses or too many licenses or not enough licenses? Every single proprietary license is a special snowflake. So like we're actually more organized than proprietary software. Our licenses are better understood because they're in wider use. Some of the proprietary software licenses you'll never even see. You may interact with that code and you'll never see that license. But each one is absolutely different. And if you think that a person who is getting like 200K a year to be in-house counsel isn't going to put their fingerprints all over every single license they interact with to make sure you know they're doing their job and earning that 200K, um, yeah. They, they definitely are. So every single proprietary software license is like a roll your own. Um, and that means that the patent clause could be in there. Usually, like, so usually with proprietary software, I don't know if it would be included as part of a patent license, but it might be a terms of use kind of thing. Um, or like a, like a, hey, we're giving you this API to interact with, and this is what we expect from you type of thing, um, and how you might lose your rights to interact with it. You know, so it's a, it's a little bit different. It's not... The, the, the reason the free software licenses are so explicit um, is that they're made to like throw it over the wall and then, you know, 10 years, if I'm dead and you still want to use that code, you understand what I wanted done with it. Um, whereas the proprietary stuff is like, you know, they might even with each vendor, like major vendors, not individual users, um, decide to rewrite that license a little bit to reflect the relationship between the code that is coming from the their side and the code that's in, it's going to interact with on the other side. So, so then in, I guess in the case of a suit, in, in general, I mean, you might be litigating that for every individual sort of agreement between companies, whereas well, in the free software world... And they might not even offer a patent grant. Like, they're offering use, but, like, it yeah, uh, often is within a tighter... Yeah. And so, um, I mean, and then, you know, if you have not been, if you've not been offered, like, a patent grant, then, like, you can, like, anyone can just sue anyone they want to for patent infringement. Mm -hmm. And that's why, I mean, that's why we have the Open Invention Network is because it was like, wow, this is chaotic and expensive and really hard to plan around. Um, but there's, there's nothing like that outside of the, of the free software movement where, like, it's like, oh, let's all just be nice. I mean, oh, wow, nice. Uh, so MPEG LA is a patent pool, but you pay for that. Like, and you pay a lot to use, like, those software. And, and, and the deal is, it isn't like, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we, didn't all, if we all didn't sue each other? It's more like, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't sue you? Don't you think you should pay? Which is really, like, I don't know if that's nice in the way that I understand nice. You know, so there's... Yeah, so those kinds of agreements and community-built solutions around like, hey, it sucks that we all have to pay a lot of money for patent suits every year, don't exist outside in the proprietary world. So any other questions before folks go off to lunch and stuff? Yeah. Uh, kind of a more boring question, honestly. But uh, going back to the code thing, like and licensing your files, like how much is too much and how much is too little? Like if, can you just be like, Licensed under GPL v3 at the very top, and that's good enough kind of thing. Is it like an intent thing? Or? Um, there's actually so if you go to GPLFAQ.org, uh, it has like a really short sample license header, and if you want to make sure that your license under header is understood in the way that all other license headers are understood, I would just use the one from the website, and it's not it's maybe like one more line than that. Yeah. It's like this is licensed under the GPL v2. Um, you know, blah, 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 like some stuff about like what year you put that license on it. Yeah, yeah I do a lot of work on uh, Moodle, like the open source project. Yeah. We include a freaking huge header in most of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's a little annoying. But. Verbose is better than not enough because like, because yeah. I've definitely seen um, files that say this is under the GPL. And it's like, which one? Which one? Yeah. Yeah, and even, and you're like, oh, well, if it was in any time before the last, like, seven, eight years, it was probably, like, V2, and it's like, not necessarily, there was a V1, mm -hmm. um, and then is it V2, or any later version, or is it V2 only? So there's a lot of different options. So, um, yeah, so there is, like, such a thing as not verbose enough, <laughs> and yet still, like, there is some mention of license at the front. 
Um, I've even seen stuff like this is under the FSF license. Okay. <laughs> like, oh, really? Okay, that's cool. They've got like 18 of them, so which one? Who knows? Um, yeah, and then I would, uh, and if you look at GPL FAQ, and I think I'll probably Apache uh, site mentioned something similar, you know, within each large directory, like you should include, like, um, you know, so like each application should have a copy of the license included with it, and then all the all the files just say like, hey, this is under um, Apache V2 as noted uh, as included with this software. So, but the FAQs for each license is the best way to get the license header that is going to be the most widely understood. So, yeah, totally. Any other questions? I'll be here for a couple of minutes if you have.